So Philip, in the forward of this book, it says that you wrestle the bear or something, is that right? But honestly, certs that are gonna help you the most are gonna be like the OSCP certification. Hack the Box has some new certs that they've come out with that I think are that are valuable. There's some new that's come out since the book. They've got a pen tester certification. The content's really, really good there. The the director of uh, the academy at Hack the Box was formerly with eLearn Security and INE. So he's over that content there. And it's more in the style of the way they did things, not so much video. It's kind of like the old eLearn Security content where you would read and then go in and do the labs kind of step by step, step going through the labs. Those are good ones to get started in. But the OSCP is one that's really going to, just about any company that's looking for a pen tester is going to, to look for that cert. And look at the different job descriptions, the places you want to work, because you know you can have a CEH and an OSCP. The OSCP is going to give you better traction there. You're going to have a better chance with something like the OSCP and the different offensive security certs. The SAN certs are good, but that gets really expensive. Hey everyone, David Bumble back with a very special guest. Philip, welcome. Thank you. Great to be on your show. I'm a big fan of what you're doing, David. Thanks, Philip. I mean, I must say, I really appreciate you being so gracious. Philip and I have been trying to set up this you know, interview for a long time, and I've kept having to push it off. So, Philip, fantastic to have you here. You've got to tell us about this book. So, just for everyone who's watching, the Pentested Blueprint, recommended by a lot of people that I've spoken to in the industry. I think it's a fantastic book, especially for beginners. Philip, tell us this book, why did you create it and who's it for? Sure. And one of the things to kind of uh, add before we get started into the topic of the pen tester blueprint was when I wrote the book, there was really a lacking of books. You see a lot more out there now that tell people what they need to learn before they get into cybersecurity, because there's lots of great books on, you know, blue teaming and all that, but no one really had anything on, and, and as well as books on pen testing, there's all sorts of stuff on pen testing out there, but no one told you what you needed to know before you got started. And one of the things that kind of changed in the industry from when I got in till now, back when I got into pen testing in 2000, uh, 2012, it was only a role that people that were in IT or security knew about. And now yeah. people are learning about these rule, roles so much earlier on before they even get into IT or anything. And, and you know, someone like myself, I had the background in, as a sysadmin. I'd worked in security, application security. So it was a matter of learning how to pen test. I didn't really have to learn those base skills. So with the book, my goal was to show people the prerequisite knowledge they need to learn before they can learn pen testing, as well as sharing resources to learn pen testing and certifications to kind of help uh, define that blueprint for them to to learn how to become a pen tester. And the book kind of came out of a lecture that I gave at Dallas College at the beginning of each semester, which turned into a conference talk. But I you know, shared what pen testing was, the different type of roles in pen testing and what's needed to become a pen tester and decided to make a book out of it. And so this is, this is stuff that I've used with people I mentor and teach to help uh, get jobs in pen testing. I mean, it was kind of interesting because I used, I had a website still do that I used to store information for the upcoming classes because the college had an outdated uh, system for registering for classes. And it was hard for students to find, to search the class. So I put it on my website so they could easily find uh, the class. And so the domain name I used was thehackermaker.com. So the information in this book is things I learned from teaching the course as well as helping others get started in uh, cybersecurity and, and pen testing. Philip, before we get into the interview and the meat of it, I want to hear about the resources that you've got available. You've obviously written a book, but I believe you've got a YouTube channel, you've got a podcast. Can you tell us about that so people know about those? And I'll link them below. So for everyone who's watching, if you want much more information, use the links below. But Philip, tell us about what you, what, you know, what, what information you're giving to the community. Sure. Those resources, I uh, highly recommend uh, checking out both the podcast, the Hacker Factory podcast, which you can find. It's uh, I do that through ITSP Magazine. You can find that on all the popular podcasts. Uh, podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple, Audible, and uh, Google, all the different platforms you can find. It's the Hacker Factory. The focus of that is I interview different people in the industry and they share their path into security and their advice. And so this is focused on people trying to get in. Uh, the podcasts are fairly short in, in format, typically 30 minutes, uh, but people share their experiences. And a lot of times, you know, people get a lot of good from it because they see someone with their background. Maybe they went to the same college. They had the same former career. Or they're trying to pivot out of the same role. I had a former coworker on my podca podcast and a good friend of mine and someone I mentored. We both met during our CAD drafting days and he shared about moving from a CAD drafter into security. And someone listening to the podcast was working as a CAD drafter wanting to get into cybersecurity. So that motivated them. And there's people sometimes that ask me, I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm 50 years old. Am I too old to start? 
and I've had people on my podcast that started careers in their 40s and 50s. So it's a good way to inspire and encourage people to start. And then as far as resources for my YouTube channel, I've got a playlist for my lectures from Dallas College based on the Pentest Plus certification. But not only do I cover the content in those slides from the Pentest Plus book, I also cover real world experiences I have. There's some walkthroughs that I do and, and sharing some of my experiences as a pen tester. And you can just find that playlist on my my YouTube channel. That's great. So in other words, this is stuff that you used to teach in a college, right? Yes. Because I used to stream my class and it's interesting because before the pandemic, I wanted to start offering my class globally and I started using Zoom so people could could take the class remotely. They didn't have to be on site. I had people from other countries, other states joining joining in on my, my classes. And from recording that, I had those recordings. I decided to, to post those on YouTube so uh, everyone had access to those. Also on that channel too, I've got, I, I have playlists with all the different webinars and podcasts I've been on, the conference talks I've given and different workshops I've taught. So just about anything I've done, there's a version of it out there on that channel. And of course, whenever this this interview posts, I'll be sharing that on one of those playlists as well. That's fantastic. I mean, so you were teaching Pentest Plus and people can get a whole bunch of content if they want to study just the basics of cyber or prepare for that exam, right? Yes. And I've actually had people that have come back to me after using that resource and has said it actually helped them on the Pentest Plus. And you on Twitter, you're on LinkedIn, is that right? Yes. And Instagram as well. Not as active on Instagram, but wanting to put more effort in it because I know it's a good way to reach people because a lot of the, the younger folks are, are using Instagram over some of the other uh, social media platforms. So everyone who's watching, please go and follow Philip on Twitter, follow him on uh, LinkedIn, subscribe to his YouTube channel. I mean, that's fantastic that you can get a whole like Pentest Plus course for free uh, from someone who actually does this, not just from a theoretical point of view. So uh, Philip, really want to thank you for making that available. But now let's cut to the interview. So Philip, in the forward of this book, it says that you wrestle the bear or something, is that right? <laughs> Apart from like the ethical hacking. So you got to tell us about this bear story. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Actually, whenever I graduated high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do for a living. And since I was a powerlifter, my friends said, yeah, you should be a pro wrestler because in the Dallas area, the Von Erich family were really well known and wrestling was very popular here. So I went to a wrestling school to become a pro wrestler. Wow. But during that time of being a pro wrestler, I, I had to work as a bouncer to make enough money to, to live because wrestling once a week didn't give me enough money. And so the nightclub I wrestled at, since I was a local, local guy and uh, worked at the nightclub and was a pro wrestler, they used me to market the, the bear wrestling event. So this was on a Sunday night. It was open to anyone in the bar that wanted to wrestle the bear. So they asked me if I'd wrestle the bear. And actually I wrestled the bear as a 750 pound brown bear or black bear, whichever the one whichever is the biggest. That's crazy. So, I mean, you actually wrestle it and then what, what do you do? Just try and put it down or something. Yeah, you try to take the bear down, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> but yeah, and, and the thing that's really scary when you think about it in hindsight is this bear had never been taken down. Wow. If someone managed to get that bear off his feet, what would, have, what would it have done? So, I mean, probably worked out pretty well that I didn't take the bear down. <laughs> that's funny. So, I mean, <laughs> you went from like wrestling bears, being a bouncer, uh, doing um, wrestling to cybersecurity. So you got to tell us a little bit about your story because I love hearing stories, you know, that can motivate and inspire people who are perhaps doing something else. I get lots of messages on YouTube where people say I'm a truck driver or I'm doing something totally different and they want to get into this. So, I mean, tell us how you, that journey that you went through and, you know, is it possible for anyone to do this? Sure. And that's one of the reasons whenever I do a talk, especially when it's regarded to, in regards to someone trying to get into cybersecurity or pen testing, I share my story from wrestling to cybersecurity. So when I was uh, wrestling uh, during that time, I'd got married and I needed a more stable job and something with benefits. So I had tried manual labor. I'd worked in jewelry sales. I put up fences, roofed houses, wow. did all so sorts of jobs. And I really hated it. I probably liked the jewelry sales better than the other things I enjoyed selling because I guess I enjoy talking to people, but you know, it just didn't pay enough. And so one day, since a lot of the jobs I did were night shifts. I was watching TV and I saw an advertisement for a trade school in the Dallas Fort Worth area that taught AutoCAD and always liked to draw as a kid. I took some drafting classes in high school. So I thought maybe this would be a career for me to pursue. So I went to the trade school, learned AutoCAD, got a job drafting. And up until that point, I had no exposure to computers because this is like back in 94. Once I got exposed to computers, I found out that I had more of a knack for the computer side of things. When newer versions of AutoCAD would come out, I would pick up the features quicker than my colleagues that had been doing it for a while because I just really had that knack for the computer side of things. Other things that I would do too is 
a lot of the companies I worked for didn't have IT staff. So we, uh, those companies were running Novell Netware Networks, you know, no, Novell Network Operating System. And I was able to figure out how to map drives and print and all that stuff where some of the people have been doing it longer. Some of the other drafters couldn't figure out. And so I kind of thought maybe this is a, a path for me to go down instead. So I taught myself how to, how to build computers, took a Novell Netware CNE certification course, 90 day course. And they got my first IT job. And so it was kind of interesting leading up to that. I kind of saw that that industry paid better than drafting because we were yeah. being billed out at $30 an hour. We made half of that. The company had to hire a consultant to come in to work on our server. They were billing $50 an hour. So I thought if this guy gets paid the same percentage we do, he's making at least $10 an hour more than me. So that's what directed me into that. But while I was working in information uh, technology as a sysadmin, I found out about security roles and I got interested in that and started pursuing that. So I worked as a sysadmin from 97 to the beginning of 2004. And then 2004, I joined our, our security team at a mortgage company I worked for. So I started out doing network security, did that for a little over a year. The company hired a, a CISO that had more of a modern idea of the way uh, security groups should be uh, siloed. I got put on the application security team, and this is where I learned about pen testing. I managed our third-party pen test, did some web application vulnerability scanning, and really got interested in it. Started taking some courses around that, took the CEH course. I don't know if you remember Foundstone, but Foundstone, I took their ultimate hacking course. And so in 2012, I got laid off, and I applied for a job as a pen tester for the consulting division of Ryzen. And that's where I got my break into, into pen testing. And so I worked as a consultant for five years and then moved into working as an internal resource. And that's pretty much it. I've worked as an internal resource for a bank. Uh, I've been a red team lead for a global consumer products company. And, and I mean, what are you doing now? Because you, your roles recently changed, right? Yes. Within the past year or so, I kind of moved in more of the marketing side of things and evangelist roles because what yeah. I'm doing there, another thing for people that maybe you've been in the, the industry for a while, maybe you want to change. There's other ways you can pivot from those technical skills into stuff that's that, that's helpful. So uh, I got recruited to Cognito last year and they saw all the conference speaking, the teaching I was doing in the workshops and uh, how active I was on social media and saw the value for the company. And so... As an evangelist, I would speak at conferences. And, and the nice thing was, is this is something I did myself, but now I've got someone to fund that, someone else to pay for my conference travel. And it's a good thing. When I was working for a bank, they really didn't care that you did that. Yeah. You would have to get the okay to their, their, your talk would go past legal and all that. And and working for a company where it actually helps the company, then all of a sudden, you know, uh, these things that I was doing for fun is now part of my job and part of what my bonus is based on. And so now I'm at uh, Sci, another company doing the evangelist stuff. I'm a security solutions uh, specialist. So evangelist is part, evangelism is part of my role. I work on the marketing team, speaking at conferences, educating our sales engineers and salespeople on offensive security so they could better explain our product show where it fits in the cybersecurity tech stack. So it's been a lot of fun. These are some of the things that come easiest for me. And so I've kind of moved into that type of role. That's fantastic. I mean, I, in the what I love about this book, I mean, just for everyone who's interested, it's a fantastic book if you're beginning. It's not a technical book, right? But it, it gives people a career path. And one of the things you've got right at the end, which is kind of like where we what we're talking about right now, is getting employed as a pen tester. So you've given people a whole roadmap from like how to start skills that are required and how to end up getting a job. But I mean, let's just jump straight there, like getting a job, because a lot of people uh, would be interested in that portion as well. And what's interesting about what you've just said is it's social media and the fact that you've networked, right, that have got you a lot of your roles. Definitely. And one of the things I advise and, and anyone's trying to get into the industry is network on LinkedIn, uh, different conferences, connect with people because Sai was, uh, I got recruited from someone I knew that I met at a conference, Ira Winkler. Uh, Ira and I connected, we met each other in 2021. We've been connected on LinkedIn and Twitter, but we met at a conference and they had, a, and he wanted to recruit me over because he's doing an evangelist type role and saw the value and brought me over. So the networking, uh, my job as Cognito was through networking. Uh, my second pen testing job was through networking. My third pen testing job was through networking. And what's happened, a lot of this was because of my LinkedIn profile going to physical meetups, but the more conference speaking I started doing, writing the book and podcasting, the more connections I made. And we're in a, 
a time now that's kind of the, I guess, the peak or just kind of an area where content creation is so huge for people that want to get into the industry. Because I've seen people that had no prior experience, but they had a YouTube channel. They're doing walkthroughs on Hack the Box or Try Hack Me. They're demoing different uh, attacks on vulnerable VMs like Metasploitable. And so potential employers are basically, it's like a technical interview. They're seeing your thought process, how you do things, seeing your physical skills. And this may be something that normally uh, you would get an interview. They would set you up with a a vulnerable environment to perform a pen test against. But if you can do this through video, you can write about it. I've seen people at our local DEF CON groups. A young man was a recent college grad. He did a talk on malware analysis and a hiring manager from Citibank was in the office, in the, in the audience, saw that presentation, asked for his resume and they got a job because That's he right. displayed those technical skills. And that's one of the things, you know, you can, people can do this on their own YouTube channel. If, you know, video is not your thing, you don't have to be on camera. If you're shy, you can, you can do writing. You can write stuff on Medium, talk about walkthroughs and different tools, content creators, while they're learning and sharing that journey, they're getting opportunities. And a lot of companies, if you're working with consultants or product companies, like my past role and my current role, working for a vendor, they see the value in that stuff. So the content creation, the networking, not only on LinkedIn, but in person, go to your local ISSA chapter meetings, uh, OWASP chapters, local DEF CON groups, your B-sides conferences, any kind of conference in your area, you need to do that networking because one of the things you're going to do too is, are you a personality fit? People get to see your personality. Yeah. If you're able to present in public, people see that you have those communication skills and those are very, very valuable. And you know, we have to get past that HR firewall as a lot of us refer to. A good example I like to share and the reason for networking was the time I got the job at uh, US Bank. I was at a local OWASP chapter meeting in Dallas. The guy that was presenting worked there. They had some openings. I sent him my resume. I immediately got an interview, got an offer. But around the same time frame, I applied for a job at Bank of America. I had the same experience. I had five years of consulting experience, all the relevant certifications you'd need, and never got called. A year later, they called me. And this is because these systems, whatever algorithms are using, keywords, it took a year for me to be discovered, whereas I sent my resume to someone, got two interviews, got a job offer. And, and that's the difference between networking. And I see a lot of people that that do that with little experience because a lot of people used to come to me because I taught pen testing at a college looking for entry level pen testers and people I would I would share resumes of other people because I knew other people in the, in the field. I knew people from our local meetups, knew what their goals were, kind of knew what their skill set was because they demonstrated at these meetups and I was able to refer them and help them get jobs as well. So the networking thing is the biggest thing that you can do. But and and I'm just taking the role of new people. So let me say I'm let's yeah. say I'm a new person. I don't have experience. How can I create content? Sure. One of the ways you can create content is take something like Hack the Box or Try Hack Me and make sure it's the retired boxes that you can use because you don't want to go on there, take a current box that they're really not wanting you to reveal how to complete those tasks. You don't want to share share the uh, how to resolve that issue, how to, you know, but make sure it's something, you know, metasploitable. Go through these walkthroughs and just create a video on that. Walk through how you solve that. I mean, you see a lot of people streaming on Twitch. They're basically on Hack the Box or Try Hack Me. And you see a lot of people in the industry that are, you know, pretty well known like Nahamsek and Tiberius, these guys will get on and do walkthroughs. So do something similar to that. You don't have to do it live, but then record it. Or if you're doing that on Twitch, record it, repurpose it on, on YouTube. So, uh, and do write-ups on it. If you're not into the, not comfortable with the video, write a pen test report on one of these vulnerable VMs on a CTF or something like that. Do write-ups on that. A lot of people during December, uh, Trihack Me has the advent of cyber and they invite influencers to do these videos. You can do the same thing. I've seen other people that will go through, do walkthroughs of those videos, publish it on their YouTube channel. And since at the time of year, that's really hyped up, yeah. you're going to get visibility on your YouTube channel. So those are type of things to do. And, and writing things up, if you're writing scripts, start a GitHub page, post the scripts on there. Even if you're modifying scripts to do something different to enhance it, share that on your YouTube, I mean, on your uh, GitHub. And then also like Medium is a good platform to write on because with Medium, it has that social networking uh element to it. So people with like interests will find your content, like, and share. And so those are some, some good ways to kind of share that. And also doing like bug bounties are huge. Bug bounties will give you real world experience. You know, try hack me, hack the box. It's not real world experience, but it's a way to gain that experience. So if you're doing bug bounties, you're actually going through a pen test. And, and as you learn and understand how to perform pen tests, you're going to be able to, to speak in an interview to the questions they're going to ask you, even do technical challenges. 
And another good step of that is something else you could try. Once you learn how to perform web app pen testing, then you can sign up with like Cobalt uh, for their Cobalt Core, which is contract pen testing. And basically you don't have to have experience. You just have to know how to perform pen tests. So they give you a, a technical challenge. You go through and perform a pen test, write a report, and you get the opportunity to get hired. And when you do that, you get like $1,500 per pen test. Uh, the required time is 30 to 35 hours. And $1,500 for a pen test is not a lot of money, but once you get six months experience or years worth of experience, then you can go on to full-time pen testing roles, which are going to pay a lot more. I love this. I mean, we've cut, we kind of like going backwards in the book, which is fantastic because I think a lot of this is what people want to know. One place you didn't mention was Twitter. Twitter is also a good place, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Twitter is a great place to connect with people. It's, I'd say for people getting started, it's a really good way to connect with people in the industry because some of the latest and greatest tools uh, from security professionals is out there. I mean, back when I was getting started out, we relied on blogs and different websites to get our information. But a lot of times the, the uh, researchers that are creating these tools are, are, you know, showing them on Twitter, sharing them with the tweets, links to the actual exploit code or the the write-up on the research and so forth. So it's a really great place to to connect, good for networking and really great resources to, to get information. One of the ways that you can build your following that I've done that's helped me a lot is participate on the Follow Fridays, which is hashtag FF, stands for Follow Friday. Share people that you follow in the industry and people will usually include you in their Follow Fridays and it's kind of a cascading effect. So you do that, you get included to other people's and they see that you're trying to help other people out and they the industry really likes that you, when you help others and they will you know, reward you that, give you shout outs or include you in their Follow Fridays. I love that. So, I mean, the world's changed, hasn't it? I mean, everyone I interview who's in the industry says something very similar. Put stuff on social media, um, but don't be a pain. Like, share and help people, right? Be nice. Yes. Be nice. Because one of the things I can say, too, is the people that are trolls, that if you're a jerk, there's, tro there's trolls out there and you don't have to do anything wrong. And I'm sure you experienced this. Oh, yeah. Uh, last, last year during Black Hat Europe, I was at the Psycognito booth. I took a selfie of the booth because it was part of the marketing thing and getting the word out with the company. And also I want to connect with people there. So I'll share on, on Twitter. So that's one of the things when I go to conferences, if I want to meet people, Twitter is the platform I'm using yeah. to say, hey, I'm here. You want to meet up? But I took a picture of myself and the guy said, fake smile. That was his only comment, the troll. <laughs> and I'm nice and I try not to say anything uh, yeah. controversial. I'm p politically correct because I know if you goof up, you can really get yourself in trouble. And so, and I don't want to upset anybody by nature, you know, I'm a nice guy, but if you go out there and you start arguing with people, you're going to cause a lot of trouble for yourself. But as long as you're a good internet citizen and be nice, share, it's going to be a great experience for you. Don't feed the trolls and ignore the haters. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah it's, you it's definitely you don't it. even reply. Yep. No. Yeah. That's my advice uh, based on a big following. Don't, don't even reply. Just ignore them. Because you'll never win. You'll never win an argument with a troll. Um, yes. Okay, so Twitter. Sorry, did you want to say something else? Now, one of the things I'll say too is, is you know, as people get more well-known and especially women get so much trolling because some a lot of these guys are jealous because they did this. And yeah, so you just have to really avoid the trolls. If you ignore them, they won't even, they'll just give up. I've, yeah, they just won't even, they respond once and they're done. Yeah, ignore them. Um, okay, so Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, Medium. GitHub, so like put your, if you, if you, if you, I mean, it's skills, isn't it? And, and what you're comfortable doing. Yes. I much prefer video. I hate writing. It's not something I'm good at. So I don't write books or write articles. I much prefer video, but some people prefer writing and then write. Uh, or if you prefer coding, then put it on GitHub. I think there's so many, so many opportunities today, isn't there? I mean, some people like slam TikTok. Um, Marcus Hutchins had a, like a really good TikTok. I saw where he was talking about, you know, how can someone like him be on TikTok? But I mean, the point is maybe you prefer short form content. Maybe you prefer long form content. There's so many opportunities today, you know, to express yourself. Yes, definitely. And the, and the short formats are pretty simple. If you just want it, you could, uh, speaking of that, you could just do a short in-map tutorial, which that yeah. wouldn't take too long just to do some basic in-map scans. So social media, network with people in the industry, try and go to conferences if you can. Um, experience you've you've kind of mentioned it so how do i get experience without a job is always the big thing you know how do i get experience to get the experience to get the job type thing and you mentioned capture the flags right so ctfs hack the yes. box 
uh, try hack me. And then you also mentioned bug bounties, right? Yeah, bug bounties is going to give you real world experience. So you're able to demonstrate that if you're able to find, you know, these vulnerabilities, uh, you can document that on your resume, you can some of the bugs you find you just of course, you want to sanitize the report or whatever you share to, to remove the company information. But those are good things to share. Another one that I'd seen last year that uh, Joe Helly had mentioned that that, you know, I really hadn't thought about, but it's a really great opportunity because I've seen there was someone in the community that was a pool cleaner, Michael Patrick. He was a pool cleaner, had his EJPT, and he got a CVE, and the CVE helped him get a job. And CVEs are easier to get than what you would expect. And Joe has a, uh, a, a several medium posts on that, and Bobby Cook has a really good post on that. Getting CVEs, because there's a lot of people, I'm, I've been doing this for a long time, I don't have a CVE. And just to me, a CVE is more important than a certification, you know. You know, there, it's a lot more rare. You're able to put that on your LinkedIn profile, your resume, and you can put go onto your publications and list the CVE, have the CVE number and a link to the actual CVE. So recruiters and potential employers can go to that CVE listing and see that you're actually the one that did the CVE and get the details. So that's a really good way to do that. And as I mentioned earlier, trying to get your skills up enough where you can perform a pen test and do something like Cobalt Core. And then the, their domain name is cobalt.io and sign up on that because I've seen a lot of people get their start that way. And once you do that for a while, you've performed pen test, you're able to pass the interview questions. You're able to do any kind of technical challenge that they're going to put you through for a for a pen test. Just for everyone who's watching, a lot of what we're discussing is in this book and obviously in a lot more detail. And I, I won't go through everything because that'll be a very long interview. Really suggest that you buy the book if you you know want a roadmap and philip that's what i really love about what you've done here you've taken us from and i'll just i mean i'll put some of the chapter headers up but i mean right in the beginning you're talking about like what is a pen test and then you're going all the way to how to get a job and we're kind of going backwards which is fine certifications and degrees you've got a whole section on that what is your advice about certifications because i mean you, in your book you mentioned ch you mentioned pen test plus pen test plus and maybe there's some other certifications that, you know, have come out since this book was 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 written. If I'm starting out, any suggestions on should I get certs, which certs? And I've, I've seen you do presentations before where you do like beginner and intermediate and advanced. And perhaps you can do that as well for us here. Um, talk about some beginner certs and then what, what should I be aiming to do and, you know, where should I go? Sure. Some of your beginner certifications, the certifications are really going to have more value when you're trying to get started because you're trying to prove yourself, show the credential. Once you've been doing this for long enough, you're able to demonstrate those skills. Uh, you're able to get through the interviews fine, but to get your foot in the door, certification and degrees can help. So some of the entry level ones are your your uh, CEH, uh, Pentest Plus and EJPT. I would recommend the EJPT over the other two because you're getting more hands-on experience. Although the cert doesn't require you to do a pen test, you're able to do, you have to do some things to pass that cert and there's a lot of value in that. So those are kind of entry level ones. Now your, your Pentest Plus and CEH if you're going to work for a government agency, it's one of the DOD list of certs that they look for. Back in my consulting days, we were looking at a government contract and my employer said, hey, if we get this contract, would you get your CEH? So they, they required those certs. So if you're going to work for the government or if you're working for a company that's doing business with the government, Pentest Plus or CEH is going to be more helpful. But honestly, certs that are going to help you the most are going to be like the OSCP certification. Hack the Box has some new certs that they've come out with that I think are that are valuable. There's some new that's come out since the book. They've got a pen tester certification. The content's really, really good there. The, the director of uh, the academy at Hack the Box was formerly with eLearn Security and i &E, So he's over that content there. And it's more in the style of the way they did things, not so much video. It's kind of like the old eLearn Security content where you would read and then go in and, and do the labs kind of step by step, step going through the labs. Those are good ones to get started in. But the OSCP is one that's really going to, just about any company that's looking for a pen tester is going to, to look for that cert. And look at the different job descriptions, the places you want to work, because you know you can have a CEH and an OSCP. The OSCP is going to give you better traction there. You're going to have a better chance with something like the OSCP and the different offensive security certs. The SAN certs are good, but that gets really expensive. This is usually going to be something that you're going to have to go through an employer uh, find a scholarship. One of the things they do is a work study program. So you sign up for the work study and you're basically a teacher's aide. So when these classes come to town, you go in, you hand out books, help the instructors, and they give you on-demand access, which you can take the course online for free for like $1,200 to $1,500. So that that's an option there. But the offensive security certs, as well as uh, you know some of the hack the box 
Academy certs are good. And then also Port Swigger's Web Application Security Academy. You've had Rana Khalil on, and Rana's got a really good video uh, series going through the different challenges in parts of the labs in Web Application uh, Academy by Port Swigger. And it's an inexpensive cert. It's $100 for the cert, although you have, you're required to use Burp Suite, which is $400. So a total of $500 for a cert. But it's like the de facto industry tool for doing web app pen testing. And one of the things I've really kind of changed my focus to now, uh, a couple of things has really changed since I wrote, wrote the book is people really need to put emphasis on web app pen testing. There's more opportunities to, to do that. Uh, bug bounties give you more opportunity to practice that. So their opportunities to gain the experience is better. It's a highly sought after career path. I mean, so it's, you know, kind of a specialization, but I think it's easier to break in that way. And then another thing too, is one of the things that's kind of changed since then is I really focused heavy on building a home lab, but now I'd say focus more on the cloud-based stuff because you can get caught up too much in building a lab and not learning the actual skills. Yeah. In your book, you talk about, I'm just trying to find the page, a minimalist lab, dedicated lab, advanced lab. But yes. um, so maybe you can just yeah. talk about that briefly, because let's say I want to like all I've got is like a Windows laptop and I want to, can I get into this? How can I do it? And then talk about the cloud-based stuff and, you know, why your opinion has kind of changed. Sure. Yeah. The, the Just a simple uh, standalone system. You can install hack, you can install a uh, virtual box or VMware on the system. If you're running a Mac, then you, you have to use something like Parallels to, since the, for the M2 Good M1 news is Fusion, is Fusion is now free, so you can use it actually on a, on a Mac. Oh, that's awesome. So that's good, yeah. Yeah, I, got, I actually got the the M1 processor tip on you, tip from you when that came out. But right. that's one of the, some of the limitations is what you can install on there. Yeah. Even from that's one of the reasons I kind of recommend going to the cloud because if you're using a Mac, yeah. you can't install anything but ARM 64 VMs. But if you got like a Windows system, you can download things like uh, Metasploitable two and three. You can go to Vulnhub, download different VMs, and set that up on your system. Because one of the things, if you do it on a standalone system, you're not having to deal with any network connectivity. Because sometimes, if you spin up a vulnerable VM on a separate uh, system, uh, sometimes you may have to go and tweak the network settings to get that to work. But if you do it on a standalone system, you spend less time troubleshooting. And then going back to the cloud, that's one of the reasons I kind of recommend that. Is you know, if you're running a Mac, there's nothing special outside of you running your attack box using Kali, Kali Linux or Parrot OS, and then using like a cloud platform like TriHack Me Hack the Box. Over the Wire CTF and Under the Wire CTF are great free resources that you can use out there. Under the Wire is Linux, I believe, and Over the Wire is Windows. So those are some great resources that you can use. And there's even some other, you can you can even get an account on Amazon and, and put up VMs there if you're wanting to set up an environment to do web app pen testing, you can install Juice Shop on Heroku Cloud that's a Salesforce cloud platform. The creator of uh, Juice Shop has an install. So you can, if you look up Juice Shop, it shows you how to install it in the cloud. And so these are the kind of things that when you do the cloud thing, you're using less resources on your own computer to be able to test. But, you know, you kind of mentioned the different types of labs. So the minimalist is a standalone lab with all your VMs and attack operating system or VM on that target. And then like the next step up is taking a separate system and installing all your VMs on there that you're going to attack. And then you can get into more complex labs, your advanced labs, where you you have individual systems. So you can use things like Raspberry Pis, old hardware and stuff you get off of eBay, some routers and switches or, or servers and different devices there and build a separate lab. Some people really love doing that, getting into it, getting Cisco switches and networking things. It, it's a good learning experience, but I'd say still think about the time Time that you're needing to develop the, the hacking skills and pen testing skills, is it worth the investment? That's one of the reasons I've kind of shifted that thought because one of the experiences that kind of influenced that change too was early in my IT career, I used to do web, web uh, development or websites built websites on the side as a side hustle. One of the things I ran into is I would use my old PC that would become my web server. I'd host websites on there locally at, at my, in my home. And I come home to a failed hard drive. I'd have to rebuild it, start all over when I could have been spending time on something that was making me money. I learned a lot from that experience, but then it got to where the point was, do I want to be doing web design or do I want to be doing sysadmin stuff at home? I agree. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's great to build stuff once, but you know, it becomes a lot of hassle. Um, to have to, and like you said, you can spend more time trying to build the lab than it is to actually use the lab. So, so you would recommend try Hack Me or Hack the Box, right? As the, when you mentioned cloud, yes. and you mentioned a few others. So, if if I was starting yes. today, that's the the easiest, quickest way to get started. I would say 
Try Hack Me is probably easier. So I would kind of start out with Try Hack Me as you go through some of the courses and things on there, develop your skills, then moving on to Hack the Box because their course is a little more advanced and Hack the Box Academy is not free. Uh, whereas some of the Try Hack Me stuff is or low cost, but I'd start out with Try Hack Me, develop those skills, then move on to, to Hack the Box because some people like to see your your rank and score on hack the box you're able to prove in between your hack the box or try hack me people are going to value the hack the box more because some companies even like Synac to vet people for Synac red team some of their challenges are on a hack the box so some of these challenges are on there so you know kind of use try hack me to kind of learn some basics and then move on to to hack the box one thing i forgot to ask you degrees did you do you recommend a degree is it required is it is- you know, what are your thoughts and recommendations about degrees? It's it's not required, but one of the things I will say, I, I do have a degree. My degree is in computer networking, and the, the college I attended gave me credit for my CCNA, my CNE, uh, my MCSE. So I basically had to take the basic courses. I only had to take one tech technical class, which was access database. But one of the things I've seen value in, and especially someone, if you if you need the communication skills, your writing's lacking, uh, the best thing I took in college was my English composition courses yeah. because those writing skills have carried over to, you know, working as a pen tester, writing reports, to writing a book, to doing writing for the companies I work for, you know, blog posts. I do a lot of blog posts. If you need a more structured path, sometimes colleges may be the way, but the thing about it is the only place you're really going to get a pen testing degree is going to be through like SANS. You'll get a lot of focus on offensive security topics. Other courses are not going to to give you that, but it's a kind of a good structured way to build the basics. So I was saying, if you really want to use college to be a pen tester or get into cybersecurity, I would really recommend doing a computer science degree and specializing in security because learning to code, getting some of those skills from computer science and then learning security is going to take you a lot, a lot further Because you look at a lot of security researchers, their degrees and backgrounds in computer science. So there's so much you can learn there. But you don't have to get a degree. You can do certifications to get there fine. I would say the biggest majority of people that are pen testers don't have degrees and some of them don't have certifications. But certification is really something more I would recommend, more of a requirement. Degrees aren't necessarily. But like I said, there's certain things if you... And one thing is too, is if you want a degree, you want a certification, that's your goal. Don't let anyone kind of sway you. Go for, do it. That's something you want to do because you get further enough in your career, you may not have the opportunity to pursue those those degrees. I love it in the book. You've got this thing and it's kind of in line with what you've said now, the, um, the pen tester blueprint formula. So technology knowledge and it is in one bubble and then hacking knowledge plus hacking mindset. And I think you, it's kind of in the book, you also talk about this thing that you need the base skills, don't you? And that's kind of what you've said now. You, yes. If, if you've got the, the knowledge of technology, so you did CCNA, um, you did Novell, those kind of base knowledges that, so you need the technology knowledge before you can think about hacking, right? Yes. And one of the things I'd recommend too is, you know, you don't necessarily have to get the certification, but the Security Plus content, Network yeah. Plus, those basics will, will, will take you a long way. There's someone from our local community that when he was getting started, he was working as a security recruiter, IT and security recruiter. And he went through and went through the professor of Messer videos, the free videos out there on the pent on a plus network plus security plus went through all those videos. He didn't get any of the certifications, but he learned the concepts and then he was able to move on to pen testing after he understood the operating systems and, and, and how to network. Because one of the things you've got, even if you're just going to secure things, if you're not even wanting to be a pen tester, you need to understand the technology before you can secure it. And if you're going to try to hack into it, find the security flaws, then you're going to have to understand the technology and security of that device. One of the things that's a good way to describe it is if you're going to learn how to pick a lock, if you know the mechanics of how a lock works, it's going to be easier to learn. If you don't know that, you're just going to be fumbling to figure it out. Same thing with the digital side of things. You've got to know the mechanics of how things work if you're going to bypass the the security controls. And in the book, you mentioned like uh, A+, plus, Network+, plus, Linux+, plus, Security+, plus. those are good so it's to start with, to give you like a like a base, right? Yes. And you don't even necessarily have to get those certs. Yeah. Although Security Plus is is a good one. I see a lot of entry-level jobs wanting a Security Plus. It's definitely not going to hurt you to get the Security Plus. But if you want to go through the Linux Plus content, A Plus, you don't necessarily have to take those exams. Although those experiences would prepare you for something like Security Plus or Pentest Plus once you get towards the time that you would need one of those certifications. So in the pen tested blueprint, we've got like technology knowledge, which we've discussed, like do computer science if you want to do a degree as an example. Um, like with when I interviewed Rana, she's got all of this, you know, technology knowledge. 
and then it makes it much easier for her to hack or you know to help protect. So that's a great example, I think. And then like hacking knowledge, like we've spoken about, get certs, um, perhaps degrees, but like certs are important. Or just ha try hack me, hack the box, get experience. And then what's a hacker mindset? Yeah, the hacker mindset is is learning to think like a hacker. So this is kind of it's developed by repetition. So you, this is doing things like try the ha try hack me and hack the box, going through these CTFs, learning to hack as you build up this knowledge base of different. Uh, base level attacks, then you're able to go through a pen test or a hack the box or try hack or CTF quicker. You're able to start thinking like a hacker. An example of this is once you kind of learn about that area, you kind of look at the world in a different way. Uh, so when I was consulting, I was at Minneapolis St. Paul Airport waiting for my luggage and I saw a USB drive, a thumb drive laying on the ground. Ooh. And being a pen tester, my first thought is, you know, there's like uh, some malicious code on there, remote access yeah. Trojan, that they're waiting for someone to plug into their computer. And it's thinking that mindset, thinking how you can leverage things. If you see that they've got default credentials, you're able to gain a foothold, then what can you do from there? Learning the different vulnerabilities, how to exploit those is kind of building up that base knowledge and you kind of develop, you kind of figure out once you kind of figure, you know, some people kind of downplay learning how to, to hack XP in some legacy labs and stuff. It's still valuable knowledge because once you figure out how to hack, you're go it's going to be relatable to other areas, other windows versions. It's just different exploits are going to work. Uh, but once you kind of figure out some of the things like brute forcing passwords, different password attacks, you kind of build that up. Then you kind of learn how to put that together. Think like a hacker and it's going to make it easier for you to find those vulnerabilities and exploit during a pen test. I'm glad you said that because, I mean, a lot of times when you show stuff, people complain, especially on YouTube. It's like, oh, this is old or this is a basic way to do things. But it's it's the concept, isn't it, that counts? Yes. It's just like any kind of fundamentals of anything. You know, the fundamentals of sports, you teach that. Some people may think it's elementary, but you've got to learn those fundamentals before. And if you've got an easy target that's for easy for someone to hack, it's easy for them to replicate, they get an idea of the steps and how that works and they can move on to more complex targets. Got to ask about books. It's also mentioned in this book. Uh, you know, you've got a whole list of pen testing books that you recommend. But uh, just for the interview, what are your favorite books and what would you recommend I get? So I'd buy this book. Uh, are there any other books that I you'd recommend that I buy? Sure. As I mentioned in the book, the hacker playbooks are good. There's version one, two, and three. You, I really, you know, version one you can get, but I say the essentials are going to be two and three. Version three of the hacker's playbook is more red team oriented, more adversary emulation, but it's a good one to, to get. Uh, the web application hacker's handbook was one I recommended, but now you can get all the information from Port Swigger's Web Application Security Academy. Uh, they actually, instead of updating the book, they put all that online with free labs. So that would be my recommendation over the book. The API hacking book by Corey Ball, that's a good one for learning how to hack APIs. You've also, I think you mentioned previously the penetration testing book, No Starch as well, right? Uh, yes, the one by Georgia Weedman. Yeah, that's a good one. That was, was actually the, the book I used for my class at Dallas College starting out. But that summer, the beta came out, beta information came out for Pentest Plus, and I ended up moving to Pentest Plus to provide students with a certification. But the nice thing about that book is Georgia takes you through building a lab. And it's it's kind of an older book. They still use like XP, but she shows you how to build a home lab and teaches you to pen test. So it's kind of an all in one book on uh, learning how to pen test. But then once you get into the hacker playbooks, it's a little more advanced for someone that has some pen testing skills. You also, you've also mentioned like RTFM and Operator Handbook, right? Yeah, those are really good ones. And those books have different syntax, Cisco, command line, uh, Windows, Linux, Nmap. The, there's a newer version of the Red Team Field Manual that just came out. I haven't reviewed that one yet, but the Operator Handbook uh, is available in an ebook format as well as printed. So that's one of the things I was a big fan about the Operator Handbook is sometimes when you're traveling, you don't want to carry a lot of books with you. And sometimes if you have it in a Kindle or ebook format, it's a little easier, a little more accessible, but it's a little more in depth and a thicker thicker book, uh, the Operator Handbook. So Philip, we've been talking a long time and we, we, we didn't ask the very first question in your book. What is a pen tester? Yeah. So a, a pen tester is someone that assesses the security from a malicious hacker perspective. And I like to say malicious hacker because over the years, the media has kind of given hacking a bad name uh, because, and it's funny, and, and usually when I'm talking to people that are not in the industry, when I tell them what I do for a living, I tell them I'm an ethical hacker thinking that it would be more understandable. But I've had people ask me, is there such a thing? Yeah. <laughs> 
But yes, there is. I mean, it's just like picking locks. Locksmiths do it for a living. Some people do it, they do it criminally, but a uh, pen tester is someone that uses, you know, different techniques that a hacker would use to, to compromise the system, testing the security controls, seeing if you can exploit those and get around them. And so by assessing security from an attacker point of view, you're able to uncover things you normally wouldn't be able to. If you're running a Nessus scan and you find a certain vulnerability and if you don't try to exploit it, you don't know if it's exploitable and you don't know what can happen past that point of exploiting that vulnerability. So it may be as simple as gaining access to the system. You may have sensitive data, credit card information that you're trying to protect. And so the only way you can uncover that is through performing a penetration test. I've heard you say, uh, when you say pen test, some people think about pens or something, right? Yes. Yeah. They, the funniest uh, GIF that's out there is the one with the, the ink pen and it shows the ink pen, someone uh, ejecting and and the ink pen consistently like they're testing an ink pen or there's even some some mechanical machines that are testing the pen. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, that's not what you do. No, yeah. Philip, I always like to ask this question for people like you and I who've been around the block a few times. If you were talking to your younger self, what would you advise you know, if you were starting out, what would what would your advice be based on all your years of experience? Yeah, if I could tell my younger self, I would have said, you know, pursue a computer career because of the when I was in high school, I graduated in 84. We had some computer classes there and some Macs in the art lab, and I really didn't pursue that, but I would have pursued an interest in computers earlier on. Better than wrestling, right? Yes. The wrestling was a good experience, and it's probably done more for my personal brand than anything else. And sharing the bear wrestling pick has probably done more for my security career than it has, you know, my pro wrestling career but yeah it's uh it, this is definitely better it was a good experience good glad that i did it but i wouldn't change a thing because i went to wrestling school with the undertaker and i know stone cold steve austin and i see the see people on some of these wrestling documentaries all the injuries nagging injuries that they got still plaguing them as well as the time they missed out with their families because being on the road and just kind of the lifestyle was just kind of rough on on people. I mean, a lot of wrestlers died early and I may not be around if I would have continued to pursue that career. But I think what's amazing about your story and so many people that I've spoken to is, you know, there's no limit on like if you're a truck driver or if you're a wrestler or if you're someone who's doing something totally different. If you want to do this, you can. Yes. And we put limits on ourselves. You think of yeah. when you're, you think of these toddlers, these kids, they think they can do anything. They just hadn't had life yet beat them down or these negative experiences, but you can do anything you want to. And one of the things I've kind of learned is I followed my passions and I just did it and it worked out. Fortunately, I would have never guessed I would be where I am today back then, but it's just a matter of just trying it. Sometimes it's just a matter of taking that that first step. When I went back to college, I was interested in it and I acted on the impulse and I signed up as soon as I went and talked to the people at the advisors at the college and got started. And there's just a lot of things that way, just take that first step. If you don't like it, try something else, but follow your passions. And, and you know, there's enough things in life that's going to hold us back, but don't let yourself be one of those blockers. I love that. I mean, it's imposter syndrome and like, you know, thinking you can't do it is, is are real problems, right? Yes. And speaking of the imposter syndrome, that's something that everyone has. I mean, I'm not speaking for you, David, but I would assume you probably experienced some of this stuff. Of course. One of the things I one of the things I finally learned while I was speaking at conferences and stuff, and speaking at conferences is kind of different than speaking to people that are new or trying to break in or students. Because you've got educated people and you've got to talk like you know what you're doing and you have to be more careful. But one of the things I see is time after time again, it's helping someone. If I help someone in that conference, then it's worth it. And you're helping someone. So don't let that hold you back. You just feel nervous. Uh, one of the things, one of the best things I did in my career, and I'm glad you know we're having this conversation, I'm thinking about it, was Toastmasters. I used to be terrified of public speaking. I took Toastmasters and then through my teaching, you could put me in front of a million people, I will speak. But one of the things that helped me the most when Toastmasters, we videoed our speeches. And one of the first things I noticed, I said, wow, I was really nervous. And my colleagues in the Toastmasters group said, you couldn't tell it. I watched the video and I couldn't see it. Once I figured out that no one sees that besides me, then it made it easier. I mean, I'm glad you said that. I mean, it's, I've, I've had the same experience. I'm an introvert and I I was very nervous speaking in public. And then I went and did like a, a, a train the trainer course, like training to be a Cisco instructor. And, um, you know, that person helped me present. And I, I think that's a big lesson to learn. People can't see how nervous you are on the inside. Yes, that was the big thing for me is just once people can't see that. And when you think about it too, they think one of the most biggest fears, and it was funny, it was like on a Seinfeld episode where they they said something about speaking is is more of a fear than, than dying. Yeah. And so they say the person given the eulogy at a funeral is more afraid than, 
you know, the people in the w- would rather be dead than giving the the speech. <laughs> and I think it's I I, I think it's uh, the, the advice to anyone is like if you scared of doing something, you know, a lot of other people are scared of the same thing. Um, you know, don't put yourself down because other because other people may be experiencing the same thing. I always like to say when someone asks a question and they say this is a dumb question, I like to say there's no such thing as a dumb question because there's probably a whole bunch of other people that have the same question. Yeah, and, and definitely try. I mean, if it, don't just be you know if you can you can speak at different security meetup groups. If you go to like your OWASP meetings, your hacker associations and that thing, you know, like for instance, Dallas, we have Dallas Hackers Association and they do what's called fire talks. So fire talks is like a five to 10 minute talk. It doesn't take that much time. So just kind of get a little practice and get used to it and you'll overcome the fear, the fear like I did. So do you think soft skills like presenting, talking are just as valuable, writing just as valuable, if not more valuable as a pen tester. Definitely. I think it's very helpful. And career wise, there's people that are a lot better than I am, but my career, I've gotten opportunities because I've spoke at conferences, been on podcasts and webinars that otherwise I wouldn't have got. And people are a lot more talented than me. I'm getting the opportunities because I'm putting myself out there. So those skills are very important. You can be a really the best hacker in the world, but if you can't convey that on a pen test report, you know, that's that's going to to hurt you. So really, if you're writing those re- pen test reports or any kind of report, try to enjoy it. Try to make it enjoyable. It's a way to celebrate and demonstrate the hard work you put into doing that pen test. And that's one of the things I would do with pen test reports is I would try to enjoy it. And when I did, it was a better experience and I put out a better product. I mean, think like you're presenting to someone with, you know, someone with an eighth grade education or something, you're presenting to someone like that, write it in concise terms, non-technical jargon that they can understand. For a technical audience, use the technical jargon. But if you're doing an executive summary to business people or management that may not understand that in depth, you know, speak to their level. I love that. I mean, it's, I think the thing is everyone brings something to the table. We all have different experiences. We're all unique and be you and make the most of who you are, right? Yes. And anything we can do, anything something anyone can do, no matter how new you are to the industry, is share information. There's someone else that's a week behind you or a month behind you, and there's a lot of things you know that you've learned that you can share with someone else. Philip, before we wrap up, I just want to give you the floor. Anything you want to say to people who are watching? Any encouragement or just final words before we we wrap up? Sure. Just kind of to echo some of the comments on you know, not being a blocker, going out there, pursue your passions. And if you don't make it the first time, it's not a failure, continue to do it. And one of the examples that that's an interesting example to share is kind of, you know, failing to succeed is you look at someone like Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan wanted to be in a band. He wanted to be a guitarist. He wanted to be a rock star, but the guy ended up becoming a pro wrestler, one of the most famous of all time and highly successful, probably a lot more successful than he ever would have been at a rock star. My story was I tried to be a pen, tried to be a pro wrestler and I ended up being a pen tester. I may not make the money that I could have made with that, but I make a really good living. I'm very happy. I'm able to give back to the community. And also I just want to tell everyone just, you know, try to be nice because attitude is contagious. So if you're rude to people, you know, it's a chain reaction to be rude to other people. But if you you're a good person, you hold the door for people, you display kindness, then they will do that same thing. Because you ever notice you're somewhere at a store or restaurant, you hold the door for someone. A lot of cases, they do the same thing after you. So trying to instill that mindset into others. That's brilliant. Philip, I want to thank you so much for sharing. And you know, you don't have to, but you're giving back to the community and giving back so much. So thanks so much for sharing those words of wisdom. For everyone who's watching, please go and subscribe to Philip's YouTube channel. Go and follow him on Twitter. Share the love. Philip, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. It's been an honor. 